tonight, Vladimir Putin responding to Obama administration efforts to punish his country for meddling in the U.S. election. But not the way you might think. The Russian leader mocking the president's actions as irresponsible diplomacy and issuing forward-thinking well wishes to President-elect Donald Trump. Welcome to The Kelly File. I'm Sandra Smith in for Megyn Kelly tonight. One day after President Obama orders sanctions and the expulsion of 35 Russian intel operatives from the United States, President Vladimir Putin downplays the punitive steps, issuing a statement earlier today reading in part, quote, although we have the right to retaliate, we will not resort to irresponsible kitchen diplomacy, but will plan our further steps to restore Russian-U.S. relations based on the policies of the Trump administration. We will not create any problems for U.S. diplomats. We will not expel anyone. Charles Krauthammer observing earlier this evening that the Russian strongman isn't keeping his feelings about our current president a secret. I think it's become rather farcical. Putin is showing his complete contempt for Obama, the way he kind of laughs it off. It's a smart to move on the part of the Russians. You put no pressure on Trump, so you give him the option to, to drop the sanctions. But this is a complete distraction. These sanctions are meaningless. In just a moment, we will have reaction from Governor Mike Huckabee on how the next administration should handle this. But first, we go to Peter Ducey from Florida with more on President-elect Trump's reaction to today's message out of Moscow. Sandra, the president-elect wants people to get on with their lives and stop talking about hackers trying to interfere with the election. But one of his top priorities in the first week of the new year is to get briefed by high-ranking intelligence officials about the evidence they have that makes them so sure it was Russia and not somebody else trying to impact the November result. Mr. Trump agreed to hear these intelligence officials out just a day after dismissing intel about Russia, insisting instead that he thinks in the age of computers, nobody knows what's going on. And just weeks after he said that people pushing a storyline about Russian hackers actually trying to throw the election in his favor were just embarrassed about Hillary Clinton's loss and trying to explain that away. Transition officials said this morning on a conference call, the president-elect has no plans to privately reach out to Mr. Putin about about the Obama administration's punishment until after he gets this intel briefing next week. But he has publicly reached out to the Russian leader, giving him a hat tip for pledging not to retaliate against the U.S. for punishing them until he takes the temperature of the next president's attitude toward him. Tweeting, quote, great move on delay by V. Putin. I always knew he was very smart. Mr. Trump said earlier this month he doesn't need intelligence briefings daily because he says they often contain the same thing back to back. But he said he gets them when he needs them based on guidance from his staff. So it sounds like someone on his staff may have told the next president he needs to be briefed about election interference. And we've been told there are going to be a lot more details about who will be briefing Mr. Trump either over the weekend or the first part of next week. Sandra. All right, Peter Ducey, thank you. Today's reaction from President-elect Trump and President Putin suggests there's no shortage of affection between the two men, but their friendly back and forth comes at the same time some of Mr. Trump's own advisors are recommending a much more cynical approach in dealing with Russia. This has all the earmarks of a ploy. I mean, the way this was set up, uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is reported publicly to have mm -hmm. proposed to Putin that Russia expel 35 American diplomats. So mm -hmm. they report the recommendation of the foreign minister, and then Vladimir Putin says, no, no, we won't do that. What a sweetheart. This could be entirely intended uh, for the effect that they want to create, which is uh, Vladimir Putin's a man and you can do business with. Joining me now, Governor Mike Huckabee, former presidential candidate and Fox News contributor. Good to see you, sir. Thank you very much. Happy New Year, Sandra. All right. Well, you just heard it from Ambassador Bolton's mouth. Could Putin's response uh, to our president be a ploy? Well, in a lot of ways, I think what he's doing, he's ignoring Obama. He's doing something that really does the one thing no leader wants to have happen, and that is to be taken lightly, to be ignored, to be treated contemptuously. And that's what Putin is doing to Obama. And, and by saving his praise for Trump, 
I think he's sort of saying, you know, there's a new sheriff coming to town. We'll deal with him. This guy, Obama, is irrelevant. Now, I think that's a strategic move on Putin's part. And let's be real clear. Putin is no friend of the United States. He's not looking after our best interest. But Donald Trump isn't looking after Russia's best interest. These are both smart, shrewd guys who are sizing each other up in the ring. And I think it's going to be a, a fascinating times. But I do believe, Sandra, they bring to, to the table something uh, that Putin did not have for Obama, and that is they have respect for each other. I don't think Putin has any respect for Obama. Wow. Well, I mean, Ambassador Bolton, uh, he's actually suggesting that the sanctions that, that Obama put on Russia should be tougher. And that really stands in stark contrast to what we're hearing from many of your Republican colleagues. Do you agree with him that he's saying if the findings, if, if, if what is alleged is true about this hacking, that the sanctions should be tougher? Do you agree? Sure, I think it's fine. Go ahead and put some tough sanctions on. But let me just ask this question. Does anybody really believe that the United States isn't attempting to hack the Russians, the Iranians, the Chinese, the North Koreans? And if we're not, we're stupid. Of course we're trying to do that. We haven't been caught. And if we do get caught, well, I'm sure we're going to see some, uh, you know, outrage among those nations. The one thing I think that is being missed here is that every nation is trying to hack other nations. It's part of cybersecurity. But what really happened was not something that changed the outcome of the election. What happened was that a very dumb Democrat gave his password away to the hackers, whoever they were, and Hillary Clinton destroyed government documents and kept a whole lot of state secrets on a private server in her bathroom, which was unsecured. That really ought to be the focus of a lot but of people's attention. But let me go back to your initial point there, Governor, because you're saying you, you've made that point all along. Every conversation that we have had is that this didn't yeah. have an impact on the election. Is that important? Because Ambassador Bolton makes the point that the fact that the Russian efforts were incompetent or insufficient shouldn't make us feel better. He's saying it's not even important to make the point whether or not there's evidence that this had an impact uh, or any effect on U.S. elections. Oh, I think we ought to be, you know, doing what we can to say, look, that's unacceptable. We're not going to tolerate it, even while we're attempting to do it to you. Uh, so, yeah, I get all of that. I mean, that's part of the posturing. That's part of the whole diplomatic move that, that we have to take. But maybe this would be a good time for us to explore the holes in our cybersecurity defenses mm -hmm. and maybe the great focus, instead of putting some sanction on Russia, although I don't have any problem with that, Maybe the, the resources we are expending ought to be to plug the holes in our cybersecurity uh, vulnerabilities. And I don't hear that being discussed. I don't hear the outrage by Senator McCain and Graham about how dare these people get by because we were weak in our defenses and had big holes in it. Now, in the case of Podesta's, that wasn't a big hole. It wasn't cybersecurity. My gosh, the man gave them his password. He was spoofed. And he took the bait. And that's what happened with uh, all those WikiLeaks. If, if it was the Russians, even though Assange says it wasn't the Russians, they said it came from a different source. I don't personally know one way or the other. Are you confident that, that the incoming president, President-elect Trump, ha is, is prepared to deal with this cyber threat that you just referenced? I mean, you dig through the research, and I mean, there are black markets of, of, of hackers out there that they, they demand large sums of money. and They're very good at what they do, and they're all over the place. This is a continued threat that we face. Do you think he's prepared to fight that? Well, I do. I think he's putting some people in his cabinet and on his national security team uh, that will be focused on it. Will he personally go in and uh, create a firewall? No, I doubt that he's uh, that tech savvy. But I think he's putting people in place who recognize the importance of it. And quite frankly, one of the things you know I'd love to see our government do, instead of putting some of these really smart, young, uh, brilliant kids in prison and ruining their lives, uh, maybe tap into what they know that we don't know about how to get into these security systems. I mean, that would be a pretty fair deal to find out how did you guys get into the Defense Department uh, computer anyway and find out where the vulnerabilities are. That's what I'd like to see President Trump do. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and lastly, Governor, before we let you go, the, the idea of, of, of pr the president-elect, soon to be President Trump, uh, tweeting about this exchange with Putin, are you okay with that? I mean, this latest great move on delay. 
by V. Putin. I always knew he was very smart. Are you all right with that? You know, here's why I am okay with it, because it's Donald Trump's way of bypassing a media that will never accurately filter, reflect, or even portray what he has said. And Donald Trump can do more in 140 characters than the New York Times can do with 600 pages in its Sunday paper. So, yeah, I think it's uh, kind of a brilliant stroke, to be honest with you. All right. And he says he intends to keep doing it. So uh, it'll be interesting. <laughs> Governor Huckabee, thanks for being here tonight. You bet, Sandra. Thank you. Happy New Year to you. Advisors to the president-elect aren't the only ones to suggest Putin is engaging in a ploy. An article today in the Daily Beast raises more questions about the, Russians, the Russian president's intentions with a headline that reads, quote, Putin outfoxes Obama, lies in wait for Trump. I'm joined now by Katrina Pearson, senior advisor to President-elect Trump's transition team. And Kevin Chavis is a former D.C. councilman and executive director of American Federation for Children. Katrina, I'll start with you first on this piece. Moscow laughs off the Obama administration's sanctions and expulsions as feeble last gestures and promises to respond in kind. Quite an article. I mean, is Putin laying a trap for Trump? Well, look, of course the Russians are mocking President Obama. I mean, he has 21 days left as president, and all of a sudden it's time to punish the Russians. Look, it's worth pointing out that the only reason Vladimir Putin has even risen to this level of power today is because of the foreign policy impotence of this administration over the last eight years. We didn't see nearly this outrage when the Russians were involved in the Ukraine and Crimea or even Syria. But suddenly now that emails have been leaked, it's a problem. All right, I Kevin, anyone's uh, Kevin address the timing, because the timing is what everybody likes to talk about in the wake of all of this. If they knew this for months and uh, Chairman McCall says he was telling Obama do something about this months ago, why are they acting now? It seems that's a difficult answer. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, and I, I would agree that on, on, on one score, you can say this may be too little, too late in terms of the Obama administration. But, Sandra, I want to go back to something you said with Governor Huckabee. To me, it's not the impact of the hack. It's the fact of the hack. The fact of the matter is that when Russia decided to engage in espionage and intelligence community with, with the with our uh, country and in the interference with our elections, it had a big impact that people want to talk about. But the mere fact that they're doing this is something we need to, to talk about. Look, America is really uneasy with the coziness that, that, that Donald Trump has with, with uh, Putin. And, and one thing we need to look at is not just fighting among ourselves about this, but making sure we engage in some of the things that the governor talked about in terms of going after Russia ourselves. To be sure, Kevin, he made these comments about Vladimir Putin on the campaign trail and was then elected president. So the American people weren't too uncomfortable with that relationship. I, I want to throw to this, because I think it's important to remind everybody, uh, when President Obama, uh, newly elected President Obama, was promised uh, outgoing Russian president Medvedev uh, about more flexibility. This was back in 2012. You'll remember it when you see it. Watch this. My last election, yeah. And after my election, I have more flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. And this election to Vladimir and Medvedev. It, and to remember, President Obama was leaning in and said there, this is my last election. After my election, I have more flexibility. Katrina, look back, reflect to that moment in 2012 to today. Well, that's to my very first point. I mean, look at what this administration has done globally. That's why no one's taking this seriously. Uh, but to your earlier question about is this a trap? Is Vladimir Putin somehow playing uh, Donald Trump in some weird way? And the answer to that is absolutely not. It is in the best interest for the Russians that Vladimir Putin come to the table with a neutral slate with a President Trump and work out some of the problems that we have globally into the best interest of both nations because Vladimir Putin has to appear extremely powerful to his people and he knows two things about Donald Trump. Number one, Sandra, he knows that leading from behind is not in the Trump DNA. And number two, there will be no such thing as an imaginary red line in the sand. So I suspect that these two powerful men will come together and hopefully do very good things for the country. All right, Kevin, in the, in the, in the same question to you, has Obama been outfoxed by Putin? 
Well, I don't know about that. I will say this. For the past six years, it's clear that Russia is not our friend. And I think that the president-elect should not praise uh, Vladimir Putin. I think what he should do is take the approach of Ronald Reagan, like he would destroy this myth about us being partners in the future. They're not in our best interests. All right. Uh, thanks to both of you for being here tonight. Good to see you. Thank Tonight, you. British Thanks. Prime Minister Theresa May blasting John Kerry for his Israel speech in a move that ties one of America's strongest partners tighter than ever to the incoming Trump administration. Tony Perkins is here on why he believes this administration was so wrong and why the U.S.-Israeli bond is so important to our country's future. Plus, the iconic New Year's Eve celebrations in Times Square will have more security than ever after truck attacks in Nice and Berlin. Jonathan Gilliam, who was in charge of the FBI's New Year's Eve security in Times Square in 2010, is here to explain what you can do to stay safe. And there's a battle brewing in Washington over Obamacare. And now the president himself is getting involved on Capitol Hill. We'll show you how he is trying to blunt GOP efforts to repeal and replace. We will repeal the disaster known as Obamacare and create new health care, all sorts of reforms that work for you and your family. Breaking tonight, Secretary of State John Kerry facing major backlash for his Wednesday speech, this time from the British Prime Minister. The UK's Theresa May shared harsh words for Kerry last night through a spokesperson, demonstrating support for Israelis some are now calling stronger than America's. May reportedly believes, we do not believe that it is appropriate to attack the composition of the democratically elected government of an ally. In particular, the people of Israel deserve to live free from the threat of terrorism with which they have had to cope for too long. Joining me now is Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Good to see you tonight, sir. Good evening, Sandra. How are you? So first off, just explain to us, why is our relationship with Israel so important? Well, it's important to us as a nation. It's important to us as evangelicals in this country. Obviously, we just celebrated the birth of Jesus Christ, who grew up there in Jerusalem, outside of Jerusalem in Bethlehem, just to drive away from there. But from a standpoint of Americans, it's, it's important that we stand. I think we have a moral obligation to stand with this uh, tiny little country. It's kind of like an island of uh, freedom and democracy in a sea of despotism and despair. And increasingly, uh, genocide is becoming a problem in that region of the, region of the world because of the uh, failed foreign policy of uh, John Kerry and Barack Obama. So we have an obligation, a geopolitical obligation. They're the only uh, real strong ally. We've got others in the area we're working with. Jordan's good, Egypt is coming along, but none are like Israel. So what kind of damage was done by abstaining from that vote last Friday? And furthermore, this speech that we had just heard from the Secretary of State, John Kerry. Well, I mean, this is this is John Kerry and Barack Obama putting the uh, the icing on their uh, half baked failed cake of uh, foreign policy that has uh, just been a disaster in the Middle East in the last eight years. Look, it, it's there's no question. This is a setback. Uh, the, the Trump administration coming in is going to have to move quickly to um, work to get the U.N. to rescind this. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of teeth, but it does stigmatize. So what does that look uh, like, though, Israel? Tony? I mean, what, how, how, what kind of confidence do you have that that's going to take place? And 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 what does the relationship look like under the new administration? I, I think, well, I think we've already seen it's very strong, even in the tweeting that uh, has gone back and forth between uh, the prime minister and Donald Trump. Look, I think they will move quickly. I think they'll put the squeeze on the U.N. The U.N. has to reverse this. Look, and I think the American people need to understand when we're talking about these settlements, these are not uh, tents put up in the backyards of Palestinians. These are thriving communities. I've been there many times to places like REL, where you have uh, a university, you have a medical center, you have uh, uh, an industrial plex where Palestinians are actually, they have, they're working alongside Arabs and Jews and they have a high standard of living. The people there are actually working out the peace process. It's working. If the politicians in the UN will stay out, are there problems? Yes. But for the U.N. to do what it did and for John Kerry to make these statements on his way out the door is a is a major setback, I believe, to the peace process. But yet you're still hearing from the Obama administration that Obama's government is the greatest friend to Israel, says Secretary of State John Kerry. You clearly don't see it that way. 
Well, I would just say this using a biblical analogy from the biblical, the land of the Bible, is that there is no fruit to suggest that that is the case. Wow. All right. Tony Perkins, we'll leave it there. Thanks for being here tonight. All right, Sandra, have a good evening. Others today are questioning whether President-elect Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu are becoming too close. Conservative stalwart Pat Buchanan today writing, having America publicly reassert herself as Israel's best friend with no daylight between us could have us ending up as Israel's only friend and Israel as our only friend in the Middle East. Bibi's Israel first policy must one day collide with America first. Joining me now to debate this, Executive Director of the Emergency Committee for Israel and Weekly Standard contributor Noah Pollack and nationally syndicated radio talk show host and Fox News contributor Richard Fowler is, uh, Fowler is here. Noah, I'll start, start with you first. Uh, is the relationship getting too cozy, as some are saying? Well, I mean, so far the relationship has just been some tweets, um, but I, Buchanan has long been hostile to Israel. Uh, it's pretty well known. He has a long track record of that. And it's just a silly idea that uh, having alliances and having relationships with other countries is like marriage or dating or something where you have to have monogamy. You don't have to have monogamy. You're supposed to actually have lots of alliances. And Israel is one of the countries that the United States has an alliance with. And in fact, having close alliances with, with special, special relationships with other countries actually is good for the United States. And it's good for for our prestige and power in the world because it shows other countries um, that it's good to be a friend of America and you'll get good things when you're a friend. And the big problem, of course, with the way that Obama has done things is he's followed this sort of Buchananite model of hostility to Israel, and it got us absolutely nowhere. We had one diplomatic crisis after another that were just total concoctions of the Obama administration. Um, they, they made America look foolish in the world. They undermined our power and our prestige and our relationships with other countries, because when you treat your friends poorly, people don't want to be your friend. And, and you referenced the, the tweets that have been going back and forth. Richard, I want to get you in here, Buchanan, referencing uh, one of Donald Donald Trump's most recent tweets on Israel saying, quote, stay strong, Israel, Jan 20 is fast approaching. Uh, he says that he's going to be rewarding the Jewish community. Uh, he's going to stand behind Israel. Uh, are there, I mean, there are skeptics out there about this relationship just getting too close. What do you say? Well, here's my point. I, I think the ideal to say to describe the Obama-Israel um, relationship as hostile is far from the truth. This past September, President Obama uh, and the state and John Kerry's State Department worked to pass a $38 billion aid bill to the country of Israel. That's $3.8 billion a year over 10 years. Now, I'm sorry, but I've been all across this country. And if you had folks in Flint, Michigan, or Sumter County, Alabama, what they would do with $3.8 billion if they were able to get that aid package for their county? They would tell you they would do a lot of things. So Israel is a friend um, to the United States, a $38 billion friend. Um, and so for us to say the relationship is hostile is far from the truth, but I think Pat Buchanan is right. We cannot sit here and support Israel when they make bad decisions. The job of a good friend is to tell another good friend when they're making a bad decision. And even Jews right here in America, 44% 40, of Jews here in the United States, American Jews, do not even believe in settlements. They think settlements will compromise Israel's security moving forward. So uh, I got to tell you, I think the far right is out of touch with the Jewish community. All right, no, no uh, going back to Buchanan's piece, uh, talking about party divide, he says this is going to make the Republican Party become the pro-Israel party. Democrats will look divided and conflicted. Yeah, I mean, look, the Republican Party is the, already is the pro-Israel party, and it has been for quite some time, and it's actually on basic foreign policy questions. This is an area where there's a real stark contrast between the left and the right. Um, the right wants strong American support for and alliances with fellow liberal democracies that share our same enemies and that share our same future in the world. Um, and the left doesn't really support our, our uh, allies as strongly, and that's really, frankly, to the shame of the left. That is something that uh, I'm on the right, and that's something I'm very proud of. And Richard, uh, let's bring this full uh, circle. Uh, Sand Go ahead. Just one second, Sandra. Uh, I mean, $38 billion isn't support. I mean, come on, that's the biggest aid package in American history. Most of that money, most of that money is required president. to be spent in the U.S. Most of that money is required to be spent in the U.S. defense industry. Yeah, it's exactly. A that, that, of, of wait, wait, you're, you're, you are, you're, exa you are exactly correct. And that this is not. It's, it's not thirty eight billion dollars. It's like right, delivery. Let's, let's bring the yeah. Yeah. Wait, hold to Israel. On. Um, Richard, I'm going to get you back in here, but I want to go back to how we started this because it's actually the way Buchanan ends his piece, and he says Bibi's Israel's first policy must one day collide with America's first policy. What is the future here, Richard? Well, the future, the, the future is this, and I think um, Pat Buchanan is correct. 
We, the, Israel has got to realize that we have to maintain other alliances in the Middle East. And when we favor Israel over other countries that we have alliance with, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, we create a powder keg and we continue to create this divide and conquer strategy, which we have proven has not worked. Right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the Palestinians are absolutely correct. They're wrong right, on a I lot of leave things. But I gotta leave $38 it there, billion, but dollars, Sam, Obama's alliance with Iran. Billion. I just really want to get this in here because this was breaking tonight. There's not an alliance tonight. with Iran. Let's stop, I'll Noah. I'll take it back just from don't there. Make things up. Lawmakers in both chambers are planning to introduce resolutions formally disapproving this recent U.N. Uh, vote condemning Israel settlements. So this story continues. Thanks to both of you for being here tonight. Good to see you, Thanks. Sandra. All right. Coming up, teachers unions are lashing out at the president-elect's pick for education secretary, but she has one very influential supporter. We'll tell you who in moments when David Wool and Kathy Aru will be here to discuss the choice of Betsy DeVos. Plus, 10 years ago today, one of America's and the world's greatest foes was executed. So what can we learn from Saddam Hussein's first interrogator, the former CIA analyst who questioned the dictator after his capture in Iraq is here. He was found near a farmhouse outside the city of Tikrit in a swift raid conducted without casualties. And now the former dictator of Iraq will face the justice he denied to millions. Developing tonight, growing debate over President-elect Trump's pick of Betsy DeVos to serve as the new education secretary. That choice drawing the ire of the country's teachers' unions, namely the American Federation of Teachers head Randy Weingarten. Watch. There is a consensus in this country that she doesn't follow. She doesn't want public schools. And she's fought against them in Michigan. And the charter schools in Michigan and the public schools in Michigan are doing pretty poorly. Anyone? But one influential conservative making the case for DeVos saying, says opposition from those like Weingarten prove why she's such an inspired choice. Former Reagan Education Secretary Bill Bennett writing an op-ed, quote, by nominating a champion of school choice and local control for Secretary of Education, Trump sent the teachers' unions into panic. David Wall is a Trump supporter and attorney. Kathy Aru is a member of the teachers' union and the founding publisher of Catalina Magazine. Uh, good to see both of you tonight. So, uh, Sandra, Ka Kathy, are the teachers' unions in a panic right now? I don't think a panic. I think I think uh, we're angry. They're angry. This is one of the worst choices ever. Why? Well, what she's done to Michigan's school system is horrific. She's put so much money into the charter schools and taken away from public schools, which is every teacher's biggest fear. We're all trained to be public school teachers, and we all know the rules. We all know how to be public school teachers. The charter schools are unregulated. You don't know what's going on, and they rank so poorly. So giving more money to poorly functioning schools is taking away right, from so public education. Let me, let, me, let me give David a chance to respond to that, because Politico uh, is, uh, has the latest piece on those Michigan schools, and the experiments do get poor grades, it reports. Uh, she spent two de decades pushing school choice there, as we know, and you're pointing out. Uh, but despite that, the state's overall academic progress has failed to keep up pace with other states. David, your response. Well, I mean, in many states, these charter schools do wonders. You know, of course, the unions are against them. The, the charter schools, the private schools, take money out of the unions' pockets and take power away from them. Okay, so why I mean, is she I, going I to be good, from, David? Pardon? Which, so because why is she, she is right believes choice? in school choice. She believes in kids that are suffering from attending overcrowded classrooms, underfunded schools, allowing them to get into private schools heavily focused on one-to-one -one, uh, academic treatment, one-to-one -one education. And I can tell you from Not 25 true. years representing young kids in juvenile hall, juvenile court, I've seen the difference between the ones who fail out of public schools and the ones who get funneled into small classrooms in private schools and end up succeeding. The success is extraordinary. No. The difference is compelling, and that's why she's going to be a great Secretary of Absolutely Education. Absolutely not. Right, Kathy? Absolutely. If our country's education system ends up looking anything like Michigan or Detroit's education system, thanks to what she and her family have done and the money that they've put into these charter schools and All right, schools but of Kathy, choice. You know that a lot of the criticism that has been out there, yeah. as Bill Bennett points out in his speech, that she's been smeared uh, by the unions and by the left for being a devout Christian and for wanting to give children the right to attend private schools that teach religion. They've attacked her for using personal resources to fight conservative.
it uh, for conservative education reform. Um, you know, the, the right says that she's been very unfairly criticized through this process. Well, maybe the right doesn't understand education fully. I, I mean, it, it's, everyone should spend a year maybe being a teacher in a classroom and you would understand what happens and what goes on. And the charter schools, actually, the New York Times came out with an article about a year ago explaining that charter schools are not doing any better than failing public schools. Uh, quite the contrary. Charter schools are ranked the lowest. And in Michigan, the charter schools are actually at the at the bottom well, of the know, schools. Well, you know, one of the... Right, that, David, that, that, that. I'd love to see the details of that study because that hasn't been my experience. And I'll tell you something. The idea that kids would have the option of possibly going to Christian schools if they're Christian, Jewish schools if they're Jewish, or Muslim schools if they're Muslim, What's wrong with that? I like right, the idea that the Obamacare, choice guys. Stay is the right primary there. issue. Let's transition. Yet another fight lawmakers are gearing up for on Capitol Hill, as we know, is Obamacare. Fox News is confirming oh. that on Wednesday, President Obama will huddle with congressional Democrats to try and save his signature piece of legislation from Republican efforts to kill it. Uh, Kathy, what does that look like? Well, I think this shows us that Obama's going to do whatever it takes to make sure his legacy does not go down without some defense. And he's going to do what it takes to convince the Senate and the, the Senate and the House Democrats to rally behind him and make sure that uh, <laughs> the, the, the repeal and replace doesn't take place. And David, well, I mean, there's, a, there's even disagreement within Republicans about what they're going to do uh, when they repeal, what they're going to do to replace. Where are we at? Yeah. Well, Kathy, I agree with Kathy in, in the respect that uh, this is about Mr. Obama trying to protect his legacy and not doing what's in the best interest of the American people. The oh. premiums have skyrocketed through the roof. The exchanges have fallen apart. The whole economic model of Obamacare is collapsing. And, and yes, Mr. Trump does believe in two aspects, allowing children or young adults who are 26 years old, up to 26, to keep their coverage if they're living with their parents. Okay, Kathy, and so also I see, the pre -existing I see you shaking your head. Are you, he agrees with that. Those are the two fundamental good parts of Obamacare that it will be left in tech. But Are when the IRS the case, is Kathy, taking away your tax is returns, working as it is? <laughs> when the IRS t deducts the penalties for not signing up for Obamacare from your tax returns, that's going too far. Look for an executive order that may just take that completely off the table, and then Obamacare will become unenforceable. Mr. Trump will replace it with something like uh, health care exchanges that will actually work. We, we, we don't even know what he's going to replace it with. And then there's some Republican senators like Collins who have said that they're not going to support a bill that doesn't replace. You have to have a replacement. And he hasn't even spoken of such a thing. He doesn't even know what to do. And it's Obamacare. Kathy, but I was just asking you the question. Act. Do you think Obamacare is working? Absolutely. 20 million people are insured. <laughs> what? 20 million people are insured. So what are you going to do? Take it away? What is going to happen to 20 million people that are insured by it right now? The exchanges have collapsed. The premiums have gone no. so high that people can't afford them anymore. The carriers are dropping are the coverage. Okay. It doesn't work. It's right. a poor business model that's collapsed. It's I got you guys all fired up on a Friday night. Happy New Year to both of you. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Happy New Year, Sandra. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, tonight marks 10 years since Saddam Hussein's execution and the man who interrogated him beforehand says the brutal dictator gave him warnings for America and sincerely surprised him. Former CIA analyst John Nixon is here to describe his time with Saddam. Plus, after terrorists used trucks in Nice and Berlin to kill nearly 100 people, we'll talk to Jonathan Gilliam about what's being done. Developing tonight, New York City taking unprecedented security measures for New Year's Eve. That means 7,000 police officers on the streets and 65 sand-filled trucks. But will it be enough to guarantee a secure New Year's Eve like we've seen in the past and avoid attacks like we've seen in Europe? Joining me now, the man who oversaw the FBI's special event security in 2010, former Navy SEAL Jonathan Gilliam. Good to see you, sir. Good to be here. Uh, all right, so New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're right, we're right in the heart of it right here. We're right in the heart of it. You walk around, the crowds are so thick already. That's right. You can only imagine Saturday night. Mm -hmm. it, I imagine it's a daunting task to ensure the safety and security of the thousands of people that will be in those streets? Millions of people. Millions. They're, they're estimating two million people wow. this year in Times Square alone. Now, we're one block off of it, and as we come in, people look behind you, and they see Radio City Music Hall and the, and the big picture of what's going on live down there. What I see as an attacker is I see soft targets. I see soft targets develop 
and I see them dissipate. And that's what people have to realize is that as an attacker, as a terrorist, what they're looking for are soft targets to develop. They're looking for the information that you already know by being in and around the areas that you're at on a daily basis, and in this case, a special event. I can't even imagine what it's like to coordinate with 7,000 mm -hmm. police officers. I mean, what does that even look like, and what if something does go wrong? Well, it's highly coordinated with the NYPD because they're really a, a, a militarized unit. I mean, they're they're the, uh, the, the biggest law enforcement agency in the world and almost as big uh, or bigger than most militaries in, in the world. So they're organized. But here's the key to this is that even the NYPD cannot secure everything. In, in Times Square, it's a frozen zone. They're going to have like 65 sand trucks set up to keep uh, large trucks from crashing in there. But it's up to the American citizens that are in there and the people visiting to ask two questions. When, where, and how can an attack happen? Think like an attacker and then look in that direction and look to see if you see anything odd. The other thing, the other question you have to ask is, how do I avoid these, these areas? Because immediately after Times Square, the other thing the NYPD is incredible at doing is getting two million people out of Times Square. And that's where the soft targets develop everywhere. So you have to try to avoid those targets. I mean, and, and, and as far as the threat level is concerned, I mean, mm. we're at the highest threat level, you know, that, that we've been since the last time you were right. in this sort of security machine. I would just rather people forget about the security threat and just assume that we are always under a threat and so an attack is possible what do you anytime. say to people who say, I don't know, should we really go out there? Go out, but be smart. You have to think like an attacker and you have to be able to look and say before you go there and say if there's something that happens I'm gonna go this way and I'm gonna get out of it because you're thinking where would an attack come from well you did a fantastic job back in 2010 I'm sure New York City is is prepared and ready yep. for this it's a it's a, a very American moment so and you have the best of the best out there but you also have the most prepared citizenry that are free and they have the ability to think like they want to think think like an attacker tomorrow all right Jonathan Gilliam thanks you for being it. here Now to a Kelly File exclusive. Today marks 10 years since Iraq executed its former leader, Saddam Hussein. The brutal dictator was captured by U.S. forces back in 2003 and would later be interrogated for weeks by a former CIA analyst who says America still doesn't understand exactly who Saddam Hussein was. Now he's speaking publicly for the first time about his history-making encounter. Former CIA analyst John Nixon is here. He is an author of the brand new book, Debriefing the President, the Interrogation of Saddam Hussein. Uh, good of you to be here, and thank you for telling your story, sir. Um, very well. How about, how about yourself? So tell us about that. How did this all begin? Well, I was asked to come out to Baghdad uh, and to uh, work on helping find Saddam Hussein. And when we found him, I was asked to uh, identify him. And I subsequently spent several weeks debriefing him afterwards. And you say this is still a man that many of us don't understand or, or, or never really knew. What did you yes. learn about him during that interrogation process? Uh, he... he Debriefing him produced a lot of surprises. First and foremost was that in the very end of his reign, he had become largely detached from running the government. He was really busy writing novels at the time, and he was not the master manipulator that we at the CIA thought he was. So you, you, get, you get called to Iraq, and then you get called out to actually ID him. What was that like? Uh, it was fascinating. Um, I was looking for certain tribal markings that he had on his hands and wrist area, and I was also looking for a bullet wound that he had suffered in an assassination attempt long ago. However, I will admit, the minute I laid eyes on him, I, after years of watching videotape and, and years of studying pictures, the minute I laid eyes on him, I knew it was him. And, and what, what, what told you that? I mean, because that, that must have been such a moment. Oh my gosh! Well, I have it in the book, and uh, it, it's uh, the it just, you Did just he say you just something know. to you? Did you say something to him? Well, he he looked at me, and he gave me this look that was the similar similar to the cover of a book I had on him, and it it sent chills down my spine. And uh, you know, we talked initially, and you know, sometimes you just know certain things, and it's just beyond what a shadow of a doubt. What condition was he in? He, w he was in very good condition for a person who had just 
had his world turned upside down by being captured. He had some minor abrasions and cuts on his arms and on his face from having the capture, but he was actually... When I saw him, he sort of acted like he came here every Saturday night and that, you know, we were his guests. So we're running on the, a banner at the bottom of this, the screen that says it's not so easy to govern Iraq. What, what did yes. he say about that? Well, that's what we were talking. I said, you know, Saddam, you're, you know, you're here, you're in prison, your government's no more. He had said we were, that the United States would lose. And I said, why do you say that? And he said, because you're going to find that it's not so easy to govern Iraq. And then he said, you know, you don't understand Iraq. You don't understand the Arabs. You don't understand the Arab mind. You don't know our history. You don't know our culture. You don't know our language. And I have to admit, he had a point. And as far as our current intelligence relationship, you said that there's something that we need to look back, learn our history, look at this moment. And what do we learn from that moment, John? Well, we learn many things. Number one, we, if we want to know who somebody is and what a government is up to, maybe instead of trying, in, instead of ostracizing them, we should, or trying to at least, we should actually talk to them and, and have a presence in country because we can learn a lot more than if we're trying to figure things out from a distance. All right, John, thanks for being here and, and telling your story, and I know we can learn more as, as we read your book. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. All right, with his tweet today praising Vladimir Putin, President-elect Trump stayed true to form, moving the media and policy needle with a single push of the send button. Up next, we will show you how Mr. Trump dominated the medium and how this might translate to an evolving press going forward. And Kirsten Soltis Anderson and Molly Hemingway join us next. Developing tonight from WikiLeaks to deplorables, we're taking a look back at 2016's attention-grabbing political headlines with the help of one of our favorite pollsters whose company has created a visual representation of what got you talking by analyzing more than two billion tweets. I'm joined now by Kristen Soltis Anderson, Republican pollster and co-founder of Echelon Insights, and Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist. All right, so Kristen, I'll start with you first. Um, election scandals, the themes that dominated 2016. What did we see? In 2016, people really started tweeting about the election after the conventions happened, and it was the issue of WikiLeaks, uh, the John Podesta emails, the DNC emails, and this just drip, drip, drip of things that were revealed about Hillary Clinton and her team and their internal discussions that really became a dominant theme in this election. Yeah, I mean, it's it amazing. Discussion... We're looking at a chart here, Kristen, of, yeah. of, of this data, and that big blue line at the top, that's WikiLeaks hacking. And it it, uh, um, Clinton's email came in second, but I mean, you can just see the, the domination um, of, of those election scandals and gaffes clearly. Yeah, there were other debates, uh, you know, things like Trump University, uh, these moments where, you know, Judge Curiel, things that were controversies where Donald Trump took a lot of heat. And we don't actually find that the Twitter chatter about those issues had spread very far beyond sort of beltway elites, insiders, folks that were already fans of Hillary Clinton. But the stories that sort of got the most mainstream appeal and, and discussion were ones that were about either Hillary Clinton's emails or emails that had been hacked from the DNC. DNC or from John Podesta. Yeah, Mo Molly, that probably wasn't very good news for the Clinton campaign to see that her emails were dominating conversation on social media. Well, it's interesting, too, to compare how it looked with normal media, where you would have things that the media decided were really big stories. On Twitter and elsewhere, people were more interested in Clinton scandals. This should have been a really good indicator that people were dissatisfied with Clinton or that the problems that she was having, whether it was her email server that people perceived as risking national security, the WikiLeaks, or even uh, one of the other things that this, this research shows is just how significant that comment about deplorables and irredeemable mm -hmm. Americans was which we have later learned from people inside the Clinton campaign, they also knew that was a big deal. But it didn't seem like such a big deal in other media coverage. So you can learn from how people are discussing in, in their normal habitat what actually captures people. I want to get to some more of this data, Kristen, because it is fascinating. And you look at the election and the candidates and their share of the conversation. All right, that whole reddish pink area there, that's Donald Trump dominating the conversation, Hillary Clinton in the blue. What a telling story that was. 
Yeah, I mean, Donald Trump was the number one topic among Beltway insiders, among conservatives, among liberals, among our audience of everyone. Normally, I will say, it's not a good thing normally to be the most discussed topic on Twitter. Typically, we see that for conservatives, Hillary Clinton would be top. For liberals, Donald Trump or Republicans, you know, Jeb Bush was a big topic among liberals for a while. Uh, but Donald Trump, in the end, wound up dominating everything. And I think one other thing that you'll notice in these charts is that the discussion about Donald Trump was constantly shifting and evolving. There was always a different topic, whereas for Clinton, it was the emails through and through, a single narrative right. from beginning to end. And Molly, the data was divided up, election, non-election topics. I have to have a little fun with this one. This is beyond the <laughs> election, the stories that define the year. All right, show it, and let me show you what the spike is in the, <laughs> in, in the far end. And in the later months of the year, the Cubs winning the World Series. Yep. Thank you, Chicago girl. I confess. All right. I guess we didn't have the graphic up, but that was uh, definitely one of the stories that defined the year. Not just a sports story, but across the spectrum. Thanks to both of you for being here tonight. Good to see you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. We will be right back.